This is an interview with Malcolm Atkinson, the Chapman Museum, Glens Falls, New York. It is the 18th of February 2004, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? I'm Malcolm Atkinson, April 13, 1920. And where? Huh? Where were you born? In Pollitt, Vermont. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were and your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was sitting on the mountain looking at the scenery. My, my wife and I hadn't, hadn't got married yet. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I didn't, I didn't know it until the next day when I got back to Glens Falls. I was, uh, I was working at Finch and Bryan at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't know it until the next day. Mm -hmm. How did you, how were you told, and do you remember what your reaction was when you heard about this? No, it just happened. Mm -hmm. I was never much of a hand for going into uh, emotional parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Why did you uh, enlist? Well, I knew I was going to be drafted. And I had an uncle who was had served for 18 years in the service, and he advised me to enlist. Mm -hmm. Why did you select the Army? I don't know. There was no reason. Okay, just uh, he was Army, so I, that's what I'd, mm -hmm. that's what I'd done. Okay, where did you enlist? Right here in Glen Falls. Okay, you came over here. Even though you lived in Vermont, you came over here? I didn't live in Vermont. Oh, you didn't? I you lived in Hartford. Oh, okay. So, um, when did you move to New York State? You said you were born when in... I was two years old. Okay, all right. Um, when you, after you enlisted, where, did, where were you inducted and where did you go for your basic we went, training? We went to Albany and uh, we signed the papers there. And from there we went to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? Not long. That was just your two induction or, center? Or, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and then we went from there to Florida, Jacksonville, Camp Landon. We was there, took a basic training there. <coughs> we was there probably until June, I would say, of 1942. We uh, went from there to on the PD River between North and South Carolina for maneuvers. And we was there for, well, we moved from there into uh, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts. We were about sometime in. Probably August or something like that. Now, did you receive any specialized training at all? Well, not necessary. The only thing I, I, no, I didn't. Not specialized. Now, I noticed it's a, you said that you were a gunner uh, with a uh, 88 mili 81 millimeter mortar. Did you receive any training for oh, that, or? Yes, Basic, I would basic training. Basic training. Yes. Okay. I also was a number one machine gunner to heavy water cooled. Mm-hmm. Now, when you went to Massachusetts, were you assigned to a unit at all? Oh, we was in a unit all the way. All the way through. What unit was that? I was a 36th Division, 143rd Infantry H Company. Mm-hmm. We followed that all the way through. Okay, now when you uh, got into Massachusetts, is that where you embarked for Europe for, from there? Or no, we uh, would, Mediterranean, you went into the we Mediterranean? We went there until 
of the winter of 1942. We had took uh, amphibious landings on Ma Martha's Vineyard. Now, what kind of landing craft were you in? LCIs. LCIs, okay. And uh, we left. We left there sometime in March. We sailed out of. This was B forty three. Forty three. Okay. Yeah. We we went to Port Elizabeth, New Jersey. We sailed out of there the first of April, nineteen forty three. How did you go in a convoy? A convoy, yes. We landed in Africa and went Iran on April 13th, 1943. We were, we were there for probably a month, I guess. And then we went from there to St. Augustine at the time at uh, the president and, and uh, they had the conference there. Did you ever get to see the president when you were there? Not there, no. Mm -hmm. We were a perimeter guard. We had surrounded the city with a guard. We went from there. <coughs> we went <laughs> we went from there to Rabat, which is 100 miles north of Casablanca, and we were there for for some reason, I don't know. Did you ever do any kind of specialized training there, or you no, were just based there? No. Did didn't. you have any relations with the local people at all? Or? Oh, yeah. We, uh, we see them, and we always talk with them whenever we find somebody that could understand us. Mm -hmm. and Did you live in tents there? The tents, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We never had barracks. And uh, when we went back to Iran, uh, sometime we uh, to a place called St. Cloud. That was a, a station area. We was there at the invasion of Sicily. We had uh, some of the high mucky mucks like De Gaulle and Eisenhower and Patton were there. They eat at our kitchen. Did you get to see them? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was a cook. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's uh, Eisenhower and Patton. They went through the line like regular soldiers. De Gaulle, he had to have a table with a white tablecloth and china and silver and all that stuff, and somebody wait on him. You know, he was, as far as I was concerned, he wasn't much of a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> what were your opinions of Eisenhower and, and uh, Patton? They were good. I, we liked them fine. They were good officers. Then did, the, did they sit with De Gaulle or oh, yeah. when they ate? No, they didn't sit. With they the sat Gaulle. separately. They sat, <laughs> they sat on the ground with the men. Really. <laughs> then uh, when they made the invasion of Sicily. Uh, we had a cattery out of our outfit that went with them to, I suppose, to have 
combat because we had never been in combat all of I was in Africa we had mm -hmm. never been in combat so when they got back we prepared ourselves for invasion of Italy how did you prepare did you oh just got stuff ready yeah, that, things... did uh, you do any more amphibious training at all no mm -hmm. no and uh I can't remember the day we left Africa for Italy, but we landed on the 8th of September in Salerno. And I got captured on the 13th. Now when you landed on the 8th, was it a hot beach? Uh, uh, yes, it was. Could you describe the landings? Were you on the first wave? I was in the first wave, yes. Well, there was machine guns and artillery and air, air Force was around. And we just kept driving in as far as we could. I was going along and I heard it. You didn't, you learned kind of fast there. I heard a, what they call a, a screaming Mimi, it's a artillery, and they crank it up and it makes a noise, and they're cranking it up. And I was out in a pasture of an Italian farm, and I heard this noise and I knew what it was, so I started looking for some place to get under or back of and in, in Italy they have water tanks where they feed the water to cattle and, and one of them was right close by and I headed for it and I, I hit, the, hit the ground and back of it but that's the last I remember because the artillery shell landed just a ways from me and I was knocked unconscious. When I come to, there was a German says, for you, the war is over. And he spoke English to you? Well, just that much. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was. Amazing. Was there anybody with you or no, you're by yourself? No, I was by myself. I was ahead of the, <laughs> most of them, I, I had, I had eight. 81 millimeter mortar ammunition on my back and, and I was taking it up. How many rounds were you carrying? Six, three in the back and three in front. Mm -hmm. They sent us... <clears throat> now had you been wounded at all when you were hit? Just in my hands and my legs. Did you receive any kind of treatment for your wounds? Oh yes. They, when we got back to their headquarters, CP control, they uh, treated my hands and legs, and they took us. There were some paratroopers that had come in that that night. I think it was a. I don't remember. But anyhow, there were some of them had been taken, and they moved us back to an old Italian prison camp, and we were there for three or four days. Now you were captured by the Germans. Yes, mm -hmm. Italy had already. Oh, that's right. At that time, given yeah. up by then. Yeah. Somewhere in that camp I contacted scarlet fever so they uh, anyhow that there was some 81 81 of us the paratroopers and I was by myself and they put us on trucks and took us towards Rome and I was getting 
as we went over the mountain. We were bombed and strafed by the, by the Americans and British. That was about the first word I learned was figure. <laughs> was when the, the when the driver said his flieger, I was out of the, he was out of the truck and down over the bank and and I would holler to the guys in back and we would go down over the bank too. Now did you have guards with you in the trucks? Well, there wasn't much a place you could go. Mm -hmm. and there was guards all around and so or there were soldiers, German soldiers around all over. We got into Rome and <coughs> we uh, stopped by the Colosseum and the driver says, come on, and we went and looked into it and that's, so come is the same in German as mm -hmm. it is in English, so. So he just took you there for a little tour of it? Yeah, we just went down. No, we didn't. We just looked over the mm -hmm. over the wall into it and to see what it was like. And then <clears throat> we were there. When we got there, we was put on railroad cars and like your forty and eight, and, and uh, went up through the Burner Pass into the into Munich. The Brenner Pass is something you can look up and don't see the top. It's just, just like driver. There's two railroad tracks. That's all there is to it. How were you fed all this time, or were you without any food? What's that? How about food? Were you fed by the Germans? A piece of bread and some cheese. We got into Munich, or into Camp 7A, Stalag 7A, and I was so sick they put me right into the hospital there. I was in the hospital three months. <coughs> Do you think you were treated well while you were there? I guess. Well, as I could be expected, I guess. They, uh, the American and German doctors said they weren't going to waste medicine on me because I wasn't going to live. But I fooled them. And I'm here. So even without medication, you survived? Yes, I had a, I had a British soldier, a Welsh fellow, who took care of me. He was, he uh, took good care of me. After we got out of the hospital, we, I went from there to <coughs> Stalag 2B, which is up near Neustadtin, near the Polish-German border. That was in uh, the last of December, 1943. We wasn't getting much to eat there. Were we, you given blankets and were the barracks heated at all? They weren't heated, no. Mm -hmm. We had one thin blanket. Did you ever get any Red Cross packages while you were there? Not there. We had them later. We, uh, we were there a couple of weeks and I, I didn't like the food very well and they, they asked for volunteers to go out on the farm to work. I said, I can steal enough stuff on a farm to eat. So I said, yes, I'll go. The farm was 35 miles from Danzig on the North Sea. <coughs> I better shut it off for a minute. We was where? You uh, 
uh, just started to go out and work on the farm. Yeah. What kind of farm was it? A vegetable farm or? Uh... It was uh, 3,500 hectares. That's approximately 4,500 acres. They raised potatoes and grain and had dairies. They raised sheep for their own use and pigs. When I first went on the farm, I worked in the woods, cutting wood for the families in the village. One day the the inspector, the superintendent, says the, we were there was 18 of us in the farm. He says we need somebody to work in the blacksmith shop. Well, I had two uncles who were blacksmiths, so I had some experience of that. So I said I would. didn't know uh, before I learned while I was there. It was a good education. We shot horses and fixed machinery and made wagons. And the oh, <clears throat> while we was in the woods that winter, we cut a tree a black spruce that was ten foot across on the stump. A fellow from Wisconsin and I fell it. We were warned not to break down any small tree because we would be <laughs> recommended for it. We waited three weeks for the wind to be right before we could cut it. After we cut it, they, the first stick off from it was a hundred foot long. They come in there with one cylinder bulldog tractor and took it out on the road. And that went into Danzig on the shipyard for gin pole to load ship with. Were you treated well by the farmers? Oh yes, yeah. real well. They, uh, they appreciated what we done for them. Now, did you receive extra food to work uh, on the farms? Oh yes, I was. I was paid extra money. We got so many marks a month for working, and I had extra rations to being in the blacksmith shop, which I didn't know when I said I would go. Mm -hmm. And uh, but all our rations were put in together and. We had a soup every day, potatoes, and cabbage, and whatever meat was put in and put up into seven different days. Now, did you stay in a separate uh, area from the other prisoners? On the farm? Mm -hmm. No, there was this 18 of us all together in one mm -hmm. building, one, one house. We was nowhere near the camp. Oh, okay. That, you said that was like thirty some miles, some yeah, miles away, thirty some. Probably a hundred kilometers okay. from the farm. Okay. Were there soldiers there guarding you at all times? There was one soldier. He was a guard. Yes. Yeah. We didn't go. We couldn't go anywhere because mm -hmm. what the heck? The, the nearest line, front line, was fifteen hundred miles away. What, 
was this guard friendly towards you guys? Oh yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we <laughs> Christmas time, he come in and stood his rifle in the corner, and we had a <laughs> we had a few snaps and a keg of beer, and that was that was our Christmas celebration. Mm -hmm. I had a family that I I worked overtime on weekends. Like on Sunday and nights, if they needed, they had no man in the family to take care of them. So the heavy work, and they kept saying, "Wait to Christmas, wait to Christmas." So I said, "Well, <laughs> we'll wait for Christmas, but <laughs> I don't know what it's going to be." But anyhow, they gave me a when the girls brought a box. There was white bread and cake and oranges, a bottle of snaps, their whole ration for a year. She brought it to the, to the fence and gave it to me. And I was invited to go to their house for Christmas dinner. We had a roast goose. Was this outside the compound? Well, our compound was like an area, a square, mm -hmm. with a fence on it. Mm -hmm. So you were allowed to go out for the dinner then? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. There was no we are not. We wasn't restricted too much. In fact, I used to take a, a team of driving team and go to the railroad station, which was six kilometers from the farm, every morning at five o'clock, and pick up the mail and whatever the big house had ordered from the. Stope, which was the nearest town, and uh, come back. They had given me a path so that I wouldn't be picked up by the Gestapo or the SS troops. Now, did they supply you with winter clothing? Or did you have no, we some got with you? we got some from the uh, from Stalag to to be overcoat and shoes and stuff. You had to take care of them because you wasn't no replacements. And during I was on the farm we got Red Cross parcels once a month. Did anybody Escape or try to escape at all? Where would you go? The nearest, nearest front was 1,500 miles. Okay, so you were deep inside of Germany. And when they made the invasion of Normandy, we were we were warned not to try to escape because before it didn't matter. If we escaped, they'd just bring us back. The further away we got, the less punishment we got. But after the invasion of Normandy, they would they would said that we'd have to take <coughs> drastic measures. We left the farm. The Russians had started coming in. To they got in as far as Warsaw, and the Germans didn't want us to get liberated by the Russians because they said that they were worse than the Germans with prisoners, which they were. So, <coughs> the old German captain of the guard gathered us all together. There were 500 of us Americans in the area around the stove. And we he says we are going to the go to the to the American lines. 
fast as we can go. So on February 13th, 1944, no, 45, we started to walk across Germany. We went to the North Sea and followed the shore all the way across. We crossed the Oder River and come to the Elbe River. When we got to the Elbe River, we went south. When we crossed the Elbe River, all the guards threw the rifles into the river. So they basically were trying to get you to the American lines and away from the Russians. Right, because the Russians were, were worse than the Germans. If we, if you only knew how many Americans went into Siberia and never come back, it'd be worse than Vietnam. My buddy, who had, I'd been buddied with all those, through the service, he was liberated by the Russians, but he happened to be right in the place where the Americans were close by. So they had to turn him over to them. He said otherwise he would not have never got back. After we were liberated, we were liberated by patents. Now were you in a camp when you were liberated or you were just in a marching unit? Just in a unit. We were just in a <coughs> an old castle on the Elbe River. And it was early in the morning I come out to go over to the cook shack. And I heard a plane and I looked up and there was a Piper Cub flying around. I took off my hat and waved. I went in the back into the the castle and told the Americans that there was a paper cup out. And just about that time, the shells started coming over. And by eight o'clock that day, that morning, Patton's outfit come in and they were three days ahead of supply. Mm -hmm. They had enough gasoline to last it one day. So they took us back into the into what place called Stendhal. We were there for a week and then they <coughs> some American trucks come and took us to Camp Lucky Strike in France. No. On May 1st, we were, we got on a boat and headed for home. We got back in the States on, sometime in May, I, do, I can't remember, the 12th, I think it was. Did you have to, have to be hospitalized at all for any side effects from... Well, he is, we, is a POW? We didn't tell him whether we was or wasn't. Whether we were in a hurry to get home. We come in uh, Newport News. And we was there in process. They give us a 65 day delay in route and our pay for accumulated from all the time we were prisoner. And Infantry combat pay and all that stuff. We got on the train and headed for New York. And I went in and come into Albany. And the only telephone on number I could remember was where my wife was. When I left. So I called it and I could remember it. And they said, well, that, the people don't live there anymore. And they give me a number that's call, and I call 
that and they come in to Albany and pick me up. When you were a prisoner, were you able to write letters to your oh, family? Yeah. We wrote. We had one letter a month and one postcard. Did you receive many letters while you were there? Not a lot of them, no. It took them a long time to get processed. Were you ever aware of what was going on, like the Normandy invasion and so on? Or I knew, I knew about the invasion mm -hmm. within an hour after it happened. Really? Thanks. There was a woman who we used to get to listen to BBC, and, which was forbidden. <laughs> so she come down to the barracks, down to the house, and said, "Hey, Max, they got me here." And she told me that the invasion of Normandy had happened that, that morning. And by that time, I had learned enough German so that I could. <laughs> I could probably pass for a German. Did you uh, stay in contact ever with anyone that served with you? That served with me? Yes. Just Fran Booth is the only one. Mm -hmm. We had been together all the while from Camp Dix all the way through. Is he still living? No, he passed away last year. Uh -huh. So you stayed in contact with him all the oh, way yes. until... Uh, oh, yes. In fact, he had, a, he had a place right next to mine up there. I gave him land enough to put a trailer on and he used to come up on weekends to... Where was he from? New Jersey. Yeah. Did you uh, ever join any veterans organizations? Yes, I belonged to the VFW. I had belonged to the American Legion. Uh, the POW organization. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? I went to school, I guess. Mm -hmm. How about the 5220 Club? No, I never, I never got into that. Mm -hmm. How do you feel your time in service, how do you think it affected or changed your life in any way? Well, my wife and I got married in June. January 3rd, 1942, and I didn't see her again for, for four years, so that changed to some. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I can't say it changed it too much. You uh, can hold this like that, we know focus on it. Well, do you remember when and where that was taken? Not really. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Do you have any questions? No. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview, sir. Yes, sir.